Welcome back, Doctors Unbound family. Today's guest has always been an out-of-the-box thinker with an entrepreneurial streak. We explore so many side hustles in this episode, things that I know a lot of you are curious about, TEDx speaking, consulting, real estate investing, and career transitions. I know you're going to enjoy this episode with Dr. Christopher Liu. Welcome to Doctors Unbound, Unbound. your show devoted to doctors who are, well, unbound by physician stereotypes. Get a behind-the-scenes look at doctors that are breaking the mold and breaking into the worlds of technology, writing, investing, politics, just just to name a few. This is Doctors Unbound, where you'll hear from experts with the insights to help you go to the next level. Let's get this show started. Here is your host, Dr. Dave Draginis. Dr. Christopher Liu, welcome to Doctors Unbound. Hey, David. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to have you on. You've done a lot of interesting things. The kind of interesting topics we like to discuss on the show, I'm sure we're going to get into some things that you've done that we haven't yet talked about very much. So excited to have you on the show. I thought that it'd probably be a good idea just to start with your background for those who are not aware who you are. Just give us a little bit of your medical background and where you are these days kind of professionally, where you spend most of your time. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I grew up in Houston, Texas. I went to Baylor for medical school, was part of the MD-PhD program, did some my PhD in bioengineering. During my time as a student, I started two companies, one invested in real estate and equities and options, and those were sort of side hustles to generate some income. And eventually it grew to the point where I was able to become financially free and independent. I then matched into uh, orthopedic surgery residency in 2007 at Rutgers. And uh, in 2008, the financial crisis hit. So that was my opportunity. Real estates and stocks were um, selling at huge discounts. So I put 100% of my effort into my two companies, became a millionaire in my mid-30s, and achieved my financial goals 20 plus years ahead of schedule. Now my business is, instead of focused on the uh, early retirement, financial independence. It's more focused on uh, creating a financial legacy. Took a sabbatical year off in 2016 and then uh, launched my digital health consulting company. And that's where uh, the majority of my time is. A lot of it is, um, talk about a little bit later, 70% of it's home-based. So um, that portion wasn't really disrupted by COVID, but I can talk about the remaining 30%. But My company right now is focused on um, working with hospitals um, with their implementing what's left of the uh, electronic health records and teaching physicians how to best apply the uh, knowledge and concepts. I'm also an advisor to an AI healthcare startup. And then uh, the other part that's really um, I've been focused on during these times is um, improving and growing my digital education and technology company. So I wrote four books last year. I just finished uh, recording and launched my own online course, teaching physicians how to achieve financial freedom through passive income streams. I've also created my own private Facebook group and doing podcasts and um, recently contributed to high profile social media sites, including uh, Kevin MD. So that's where I am right now. And I'm glad to you know, expand upon any of those topics. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Like you, you definitely have that, that entrepreneurial spirit. And it sounds like you've had it from pretty early on. Was that difficult? Because you, you know, you had it during your training and medical training can require so much of your time. So did you end up like going through and finishing residency? Did you like have too many, <laughs> kind of too many things going on and too many opportunities in the business world? You know, how did all that play out for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Really, my passion overall was just was in business and financial independence and entrepreneurship. So it came in 2008. Starting in 2002, I started to see the effects of managed care and how the government was getting into the healthcare business and creating implementations that would um, be the resulting healthcare crisis that we have today that would no longer be sustainable. I started that seeing that in 2002. And by 2008, I wasn't really getting a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment in my career. So I had had a choice. I had either to really um, 
focus 100% on my company or just go down a path that was really not leading me anywhere. Again, I had a lot of resistance, but I, I took a leap of faith. My intuition told me to pour all my knowledge and efforts into my passions. And so that's what I did. And it actually turned out to be, it was a high risk gamble, but it was calculated and it paid off in huge returns, both financially as well as time, freedom, and independence. But uh, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit at an early age, just because um, I saw at an early age what financial freedom and independence could do. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't want to ever be tied to um, or be dependent upon the government or a job or things like that. I wanted to be able to create my own freedom and independence. Yeah, for sure. I think this whole pandemic with with COVID-19, unfortunately, has hit physicians pretty hard, not only from the standpoint the exposure that we're getting in the hospitals, but also as if that weren't bad enough, also getting the exposure or taking the hit, I should say, financially. So let's talk a little bit about you and your setup. I think you said earlier that you've got a good portion of what you're doing that is either online or remotely. So how has this pandemic affected you and the businesses and the way that you earn money these days? Yeah, I know a lot of people are suffering out there right now in my heart goes out to them. So that's one of my passions from this is just helping people go through these crises. So, but I've been planning for these types of crises ever since 9-11 happened, starting with education and then launching my companies. But uh, again, 70% of my business is at home. So it's a lot of it's like technology, like these webinars, podcasts, email, things like that. I've Since 2008, I've developed a lot of tools and automated a lot of things. So it doesn't require people and it doesn't require me. So it's I'm slowly trying to step away from my business so I can run on autopilot so I can focus on more higher level and legacy type goals. Mm -hmm. The 20% that they get affected is mostly travel related. So to do a consulting project with the hospital next month, but instead of getting it canceled, it's just been postponed or delayed. So that's the disruption there. Also, I was supposed to give a a TEDx talk in April of this month, but that's also been postponed till um, October. The 10% of my business that has been affected was something I didn't plan for. So I'm always trying to cover all my bases. But again, I didn't anticipate this sort of thing happening this early. But that's the 10% where I had to pivot and innovate and change very quickly. And that's the one I've been solely focused on during this quarantine, just focus on developing new skill sets, tools, evaluating areas that I can automate that didn't work and implementing systems so that when the next crisis hits, it won't be as disruptive and I'll be even more prepared. Yeah. I want to dive a little bit into the part where you said you're, you, you had a, a consulting gig with a hospital. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit more what that job is and how you came to even get that I think that would be really interesting for our readers. Like, did you have a company set up? What kind of background did you have to have? What services are you providing for the hospital? Because I think that's really neat. Yeah, exactly. So because uh, a lot of these hospitals um, are transitioning or have transitioned into the electronic digital health record era, a lot of that's being phased out now since 2009, 2010, when Obama started mandating. But slowly that portion of business is transitioning. So But what I essentially do is I go into the hospital as a consultant. They love medical doctors because it gives you a brand authority and trust that you can't find with other consultants. And basically, I help the hospitals implement new electronic health record systems. So for example, Epic, Cerner. And then the real challenge isn't really the implementation, but the real challenge is transitioning, teaching the uh, end users, so physicians, nurses, staff on how to learn the system and how to best apply it to their workflows. So how to optimize their um, efficiency and how to enable them to create automated functions so that they can focus more on patient care and clinical judgment and things like that. The next phase of this consulting is using, now that the electronic health records are being implemented, the next phase will be how to best use the data for both clinical diagnosis, prognosis, treatment outcomes. So that's one area. And really, it's what I did was I first started because we all work in the healthcare system. So we all are familiar with this um, electronic health record system. 
And as you develop a good brand and trust and reputation, there's a lot of hospitals looking for digital health consultants and physicians that are good with IT and information technology. And initially, because I was starting out, I was the small guy, I started out, the hospitals hired me. And eventually, where my brand grew and my reputation grew, I was able to attract my own clients and my own clientele. So that's how that sort of worked. But again, it's a great opportunity for physicians looking to pivot into a um, non-clinical career, but stay in, inside the uh, clinical profession in the fields. And it's really highly rewarding, highly lucrative, highly flexible, highly enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. We had a hospital that recently transferred to Epic. And even though I was already familiar with Epic from a different hospital, this was a different version. Uh And I didn't even realize they could have different versions. And the physician consultants that were there for like the first month kind of walking us through everything were like gold because otherwise the workflow would have been ridiculous. So it was was definitely helpful. And it started talking to them and kind of getting an understanding of who they are and what they do. Very, very fascinating that they kind of have this side gig going on. So that's really, really cool. One thing that we hadn't we haven't talked about much on the podcast is speaking and and TEDx speaking. So I would love for you to tell us kind of what you've done in this arena and then advice to other docs who are looking to kind of ramp up uh-huh. their speaking opportunities. Yeah. So I think speaking is one of the most highly enjoyable parts of my company because it's my my chance to go out there and share my message and my story. A lot of times I'm behind the computer screen or in the meeting room. So, but when you're out out on the stage and you're presenting and you're speaking, that's the fun and joy of it. And that's the rewarding part. But as a speaker, there's a lot of numerous benefits. So I, I speak for a lot of reasons. One is just like a podcast and a, as a brand and speaking it can strongly enhance your network. So what I tell clients is traditionally, you know, you're the handshake or going to the meeting and conferences and exchanging the business cards. That's sort of um, networking 1.0. But with these new social media platforms and the content creators, that's networking 2.0. So that's like networking on steroids. So it highly improves your, your network. The second thing is it helps with your marketing and your brand. So I talk a lot about future-proofing yourself. I'm always thinking about what are the existential threats, either like biologically or career-wise, what are the things that will demolish us? So I always try to future-proof myself. And so creating a strong following and a creating a unique, authentic, personal brand is the only way to future-proof yourself against things such as COVID-19 and things like all these crises that are going to happen in the future. The third thing is, you know, it pays very well if you like traveling, if you like sharing, inspire, motivate, sharing your story, influencing and educating. So that's in a nutshell. For TEDx, it's a little bit different because one thing that really helped me to get onto the TEDx stage was I would watch the TEDx videos, the TED videos, Mm -hmm. and just glean certain things that are very interesting how speakers take certain topics and make them interesting or make it their own. So that, that really helped me. It's really the, for Ted, they're actually looking for a very, very unique brand and story. So a lot of people that have traditional pathways, people that are used to linear thinking or just have like a very um, orderly stepping stone in their careers usually will struggle, but having a unique brand story a one of a kind. So for example, Mine was leaving a orthopedic surgery career to discover my true talents and passions. So a lot of that comes from Joseph Campbell's hero journey. So that's one thing that will really make you stand out. You have to really stand out and have a very unique, interesting story and an idea that's presented in a very creative way. And then is there a an application process. I haven't followed it too closely, but uh-huh. you kind of, you, I think you have to kind of get selected or, or something like that, right? Yeah. They're usually solicit. So people that they know, they'll contact you and ask you if you're interested, but it all goes through a process. So you have to submit your idea in writing. You also have to do a um, video submission as well. So, and then it just, once you have a strong brand and a really great following and a unique story, that's how you sort of filter yourself above. So 
for all physicians that are interested in public speaking and TEDx speaking, you know, start thinking about what is your unique differentiator outside of clinical medicine and start creating story and unique ideas around that that you can share to the world. Yeah, very good advice. We'll pivot a little bit to real estate because I remember hearing something about real estate in, in that initial salvo there. So I'd love to hear your experiences in real estate and if there's a particular niche or type of real estate that you focused on. Yeah. So real estate and uh, stocks were how I got my financial freedom. And it's really, it was more just to learn about the business and how to create passive income and how to automate it. But um, I started real estate investing back in 1999. Back then, condos in Houston were really much cheaper than paying standard rent. So, you know, it started out with a two bed, two bath condo. I did a lot of house hacking. I did a lot of renovation. I did a lot of the Burr method. And eventually that- grew. House hacking before it was probably even called house hacking. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it was really interesting because uh, back then I didn't even know it was called house hacking. And, you know, I was doing a lot of the concepts, you know, based on that. Yep. And, um, and so, and I had such a great experience because I had great roommates and I was able to, back then I was using email marketing and then eventually transitioned into YouTube and now social media marketing. But uh, eventually it just got to the point where I slowly, all my client and my business was transitioned onto the Airbnb marketing platform. So what I really enjoy is really the unique experiences. Financially, it's very rewarding, but it's more of the unique experiences you create with the guests and how you can take a space and basically create a unique experience about it. The other thing that I really love about real estate is um, it takes a lot of time and money, but I really enjoy the renovation process. I recently bought a uh, two-bed, two-bath condo in 2018 and basically uh, renovated the whole thing. But uh, you know that took a lot of time and effort. But once you get it up and running and set up, it's highly rewarding. So I really like the design aspects, the marketing aspects, the guest experience aspects. So let me ask you this, assuming that condo was not for your own personal residence, or maybe it was because you were hacking, are you looking at it from the standpoint of taste and kind of like what you like, or are you like very calculated and say, hey, for this particular type of real estate costs this much, I can afford X amount of dollars. And so I've got to kind of keep my renovations within this budget. I'm curious which way, because when you have kind of a taste for it or you take enjoyment of it, it might be easier to maybe overspend. I'm curious how you approach it. Yeah, that's a great question. I do have a budget. For example, that last renovation project I did, I did splurge a little bit, but I think in terms of the client, because I know I've talked to like my brother-in-law and my friends who are also investors, they, they're like just putting the minimum bare amount so that you can get it rented out. But my thinking is um, I like to analogize it to the company Apple because for example, their iPhone people are willing to wait 24 hours stand in line and pay over $1,000 for a phone, right? But they wouldn't do it for something like a Samsung or, or Nokia or things like that. So I like to create brand experiences where mm-hmm. people, they feel like they're getting that value from it. It's almost like a loyalty and a following. But again, there is a budget and you have to balance that as well. So... Yeah, I agree with you. We're also in the short-term rental or Airbnb game. And probably by the time this airs, we'll be well underway with our Airbnb course, which I've just launched recently. Oh, oh, great. And so what I found in my market is that there's a definite advantage to being kind of the top property or in the top few properties of your market. And we noticed that even with everything getting shut down and losing thousands of dollars of bookings kind of overnight, we were able to rebook. Yeah. Granted, we, we did have to lower prices some, but we were able to rebook and at least break even with that property when some people had nothing coming in because it was the top property in the market and people just wanted that property, it had great reviews, it, it looks uh-huh. fantastic. So there's a book called, the, I believe it's The Star Principle, and it's the idea that if you are like the top business in your particular niche, you're going to have some outsized returns. And we've seen that on, granted, on a much smaller scale with our Airbnbs in our market. Okay. That's actually exactly what happened to me because uh, back in March, when they were shutting down everything, a lot of my clients were foreign medical students coming here for rotations. And 
when hospitals were shutting down for the rotations. I also faced a similar dilemma as just tons of cancellations, but it was very interesting because I have great reviews and um, I'm a uh, super host, so mm-hmm. I was able to book right away. Again, I did offer a slight discount just because of the times. So, but I, I think that if you have a nice place and you have good customer experiences, you do very well, just like you said. Yeah, absolutely. We, we definitely saw that with both of our properties here in the Dallas area. You've done a lot outside of clinical medicine, consulting. I think you do some coaching. We haven't even touched on that yet. Is there a favorite side gig that you have you know, now that you've experienced so many different careers and niches? Yeah. My favorite thing is, even though it's still scaling, it's still growing, and I'm still building it, is my um, digital education companies. That's really been really the most rewarding part. It's brought in a little bit of side income, but not enough. It's more just like just play income. But uh, I really enjoy the digital education. I love creating videos, uh, writing articles. I love talking about how physicians can beat the system because I think the system is really abusing physicians right now. So, you know, I'm really passionate about helping physicians get out of burnout, transitions, find financial freedom, and just the whole video. There's so many different platforms, YouTube, Instagram, just everything. So it's just really the digital education content has been the most rewarding. Very cool. Advice to doctors who are listening to this and maybe are thinking, hey, I'd like to transition either completely away or maybe just partly. Maybe they say, hey, I I still love medicine, but I would maybe just want to kind of do it a little bit more part-time, but not sacrifice income. Any tips for those doctors on ways that they can transition from full-time clinical practice? Yeah, definitely. I have a very unique approach. Mine is very entrepreneurial, so it may not resonate with some physicians, but my goal is to just inspire and motivate. If I can do that and get you to take action, then I've done my job. One thing is uh, like listening to these podcasts, um, joining Facebook groups, going to a lot of uh, networking events, talking about just financial freedom, real estate, investing, passive income, a lot of things that are sort of outside of the box type seminars. So I, that's one way. If you're interested, I, I've written four books. I do have to put a caveat that my books are more inspirational and motivational. So I know some physicians, if they're looking for like a, a holy grail, they may come away. It's not exactly for them. It's not a recipe of, of how to get out. It's got it. Yeah, it's more like a story and just give you different ideas, plant different ideas and seeds on how you can diversify your skill set. The other thing is hire, just you know, get an hour or two hours with a mentor or coach or somebody who's done it. That one or two hours can save you years. I'll give you an example. Like I've had clients who reach out to me and like in one or two hours, that saves them two or three years. Whereas clients that sort of just um, are on the fence don't really know what to do, that struggle for two, three years. So really just get someone advice, consultation for an hour or two, and then that'll set you on the road much faster. It's a lot of it's just time versus savings, the fees and things like that. If you calculate it and you're smart about it, you can use that to propel yourself further ahead. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think physicians, once you get into especially once you're through residency and, and you're, you're becoming attending, that access of time versus money, you tend to have less time and a little bit more money. I noticed that even when launching my podcast, I kind of, all the information is there. You can sit there and Google it or jump on YouTube and spend hours and hours of time, but it was actually super valuable to find a few people who I knew and respected in the field and just buy their course and buy into their community and learn from them like step by step how to launch a podcast Yeah, because you can trust the information and it gives you kind of a step-by-step approach. And so I found that super valuable, well worth the money. So I agree with you having some very good mentors and even purchasing courses or things like that no. can save you a lot of time. So I'll end with this question. Usually <laughs> I ask people, you know, where they would travel in these days. It's so funny because we've all been cooped up in our homes here in Dallas. We've been cooped up now for, I think it's been over a month or so. So I'd love to hear it from you. Like, you know, once you're back into traveling and you're able to go someplace, where's the kind of the first place on your <laughs> list if there's no bans and no commitments to stand in the way? <laughs> yeah, I, I love that question. 
I'm actually in the process of planning what I call a life hack where I'm able to live remotely for two years with the same lifestyle, but in with the same income where I put all of my businesses and companies on autopilot. So I'm in the process of doing that. But some of the places that I'm looking at are Belize, Colombia, looking into India, Middle East, Thailand, Bali, things like that. It's just anywhere where there's like a low cost of living, but high quality. So any of those areas. And I'm always up for new experiences, adventures, you know, meeting people, things like that. So you're going to do a little geographic arbitrage on top of everything. Yeah. All right. So we'll, so we'll have to get back in touch with you once you've implemented the life hack and, and, you know, we'll do this remotely from wherever, wherever you're at. I'll give you a final word. Anything else, the last word you'd like to say to the guests and the best place for them to be able to reach and get in touch with you. I'm happy to uh, share my experiences with you. I feel free to reach out to me. I'm very active on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. You can Google my name. I'm very responsive to email. And just think of these times as just a preparation for the next one. So take what you can and learn from it and implement it and use it for the next one. So in the next crisis, we can all be stronger and better and more robust. Yeah, I like that. You know, learn what you can, always be prepared. We don't know what the next challenge will look like, but if you're ready for it, if you've got cash reserves and got the right points and all that stuff, uh, you stand a better chance of getting through it. Dr. Christopher Liu, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, sharing all your experiences and sharing of all your varied expertise with me and with the uh, Doctors Unbound audience. Thank you for listening to Doctors Unbound Podcast. Remember to head over to DoctorsUnbound.com to access all the show notes and resources discussed in this episode. Now, it's your turn to be Unbound.